My name is Terrence Barkin. I'm the Executive Director of the Graphene Council. We're hosting today's session that is looking at computational modeling of 2D materials, which is a very uh, sophisticated topic. And fortunately, we have an excellent subject matter expert on this, and that's Professor Hong Guo from McGill University. He is a professor of physics at that institution, and he's also a fellow of the American Physical Society and a member of the Royal Society of Canada. So with that being said, Professor Guao, we very much look forward to your, um, your presentation and discussion on this, on this uh, very interesting and relevant topic. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to, uh, uh, to this presentation webinar. And uh, uh, so I will uh, try to uh, explain um, some computational tools and uh, how do we apply them to solve uh, some problems that cannot be done before without these uh, computational tools. And uh, so I will focus on first principles tools. And there are a lot of tools. Uh, you know, in the past I do weather simulation. I will not use first principle tools, okay? But here for material science, we have to do uh, sometimes we have to really look at the atoms and so on, electronic structure, and we need these first principle tools. And I will explain to you uh, what was the challenge and we had to overcome in order to do these big systems and so on. So here is uh, my organization and uh, I will uh, just move on, okay? Um, so here, uh, a little bit about our organization. We are a, a firm which uh, we founded in 2008 our main uh, research actually in the firm is uh, developing uh, and innovating you know, modeling tools, simulation tools and design tools for advanced materials, for um, semiconductor devices, for IC. Uh, and uh, more recently, uh, we have a very exciting tools for um, designing qubits. Okay, so these are the main thing that we do in the company and we are located in downtown Montreal and uh, uh, here is the building we are in there. And uh, here is the McGill University where I also, uh, I teach. Okay, I'm a professor of physics there. I can see my office there. So today I will talk about some of these tools. We have a lot of other tools. And if you are interested, you can uh, follow us uh, in this uh, links. All right, so let me first begin by thanking my scientific team in the, uh, uh, in the company. Uh, these are PhDs in physics, material science, engineering, chemistry, and, and Jeremy uh, is here, uh, he's my um, um, business development actually uh, director. Uh, so, so let me thank them. I, I will, certain people will show up and I have other people I didn't have time to find the picture. So uh, I apologize. Okay, so here is the outline uh, of my uh, webinar today. I want to introduce you to first principle of computational material science. And then I will explain the difficulties and what is the thing that we have to do to overcome these difficulties uh, very briefly. And then we're going to apply these tools to um, graphene. Uh, this is relevant to uh, this community. And we're going to look at these Mori structures, uh, which is very interesting um, system, which are quite you know, uh, common uh, thing uh, in two dimensional systems. And then I will also talk about another application of graphene to um, uh, low power transistors. This is another thing that uh, graphene can play a tremendous role. Okay, so uh, I wish to convince you that this is an exciting uh, area. So in first principles modeling, uh, we talk about atoms. And so, so right now the state, you know, the, the, the state of the art of the software, uh, actually you can solve reasonably comfortably a few hundred atoms. But that's, that's far from reality, okay. So here is an example. Uh, I just take a very simple example from uh, STM. Uh, this is a, a surface probe, scanning probe uh, to look at uh, the surface properties uh, through a tip. So typically, theoretically, um, the tip is thought about the atom or something like that. But nobody really was able to determine the positions of these tip atoms except my colleague Peter Gruter lab uh, with his graduate student, they were able to map every atom on the tip, the position of it, more than a thousand atoms. They can tell you where the atoms are. The interesting issue is that, you know, does every atom contribute to the forces for example? 
So Tangdoni, you know, so in order to do this kind of calculations to answer these questions, you have to model systems metal of 2,000, 6,000 atoms. So these are much bigger than what we can do uh, in typical uh, material simulation, uh, atomic simulation tools. And this is a chemistry. Uh, my colleague, uh, Prepetrica's lab, they study surface chemistry, depositing certain molecules on graphite. And then, you know, the question is that what are these patterns? Okay, so to model this, you'd have to solve problems from density functional theory, something like 13,000 atoms. You know, this is another example. Uh, my colleague, um, collaborator, they work on uh, molecular junctions, including all these graph graphene electrodes, and you have a huge number of atoms and you want to study. And then in order to do this, you have to calculate them. And then there are you know, liquid solid interfaces in lithium batteries. These, all of this involve huge number of atoms. And this is another one on artificial photosynthesis uh, using two dimensional material to coat, uh, to, to actually uh, coat uh, nanowires, uh, semiconductor nanowires for catalysts. And then to produce these solar fuels right here, and you need all sorts of materials as the catalyst. You know, some of them are vaccines, some of them are others, and two-dimensional material, but these materials look like this. And then you have a huge number of atoms to worry about. So we have some publications, you know, these kind of things. So there is a need to solve big systems. I want to ask you uh, for a <laughs> part that I want to show you one, you know, graph with some formula because I'm a theorist. And then this is, um, the equation that we have saw. This is you know, this eigenvalue equation in density functional theory. I want to show you why we couldn't do very big systems before. Okay, so basically you have to diagonalize a homotonic matrix and then you have a loop you have to converge. Okay, you have to solve this many, many times. So basically you fo let's focus on this, you know, Schrodinger equation or cone jam equation, which is a diagonalization of big matrix. How big is this matrix? You know, suppose you have a small problem of a thousand electrons. You know, this homotonic matrix can be a million by a million. Okay, so basically, let's say you have a thousand bands you want to calculate. Your homotonic is a million by a million. So you have to diagonalize this big matrix for even a reasonably small system. Okay. And then after you calculate every matrix element extremely accurately by iterating this loop, you know, patiently, at the end of the day, you only need a thousand bands, okay? So you could get a million bands, but you don't need them. You only need a thousand bands because you only have a thousand electrons. Okay, so this means that we actually have calculated a very big matrix very accurately through these patients. And then we only need a small part of it. So that's the problem of all of these first principle simulation tools. Obviously nobody does this. So in state of the art, what people do is this is a homotonic matrix. We don't need most of them. So we do something called subspace technique. So we, sub, we only solve a small part of the problem and to find what we need. So what we need is this little you know, red square or something like that. So there are different tools, Krylov subspace, you know, atomic orbital Gaussian, all of these tools are trying to suppress this big Hubert space to solve a small problem but there are a lot of room to improve, okay? Because we only need this part, why we should use such a big subspace. So there are a lot of mathematics that you can invent or you can adapt, a lot of computational uh, algorithm development. So basically this is done by uh, Vincent, who is you know, one of our, uh, our, our product manager in this code called Rescue, which basically solves what you need. Okay, so that, that's why you can solve very big systems. And if you are interested in this tool, uh, there is a paper which we publish all the technical details over there. Okay, so forget about these words. So essentially what we have done is to push the density functional theory calculation method to something like many tens of thousands. We typically do 20,000 atoms. The largest one we had to do for some grant is more than 100,000. So basically by innovating this computational mathematics, you can actually push this much further into real application domain. So before in 2017, 
you know, material science uh, first principles is about 10, you know, a hundred, a thousand atoms or something. So now we can actually break this, you know, bottleneck. So now I'm going to use these tools to simulate, to study something new. Uh, this is graphene uh, Mori uh, structures. All right. So Mori structure is very interesting because, you know, we see this every time. This is the optical perception. If you have two lattices, you know, you see these large scale structures, uh, which is basically the optical perception. Um, when they have different angles or the lattice constants are different, you have very complicated patterns. But now we are talking about two layers of atoms. Let's say one is graphene, the other is hexagonal boronitrite, for example. You still have this, you know, Mori pattern. But these atoms will interact. So this Mori pattern has different edges and so on. And then this new atomic structure, this large scale atomic structure can induce interesting functionality. Okay, so this is something that uh, we wish to study. Experimental people are studying this. Uh, we are interested in this. But in order to do this, you have to solve a huge number of atoms and our tools are perfect for this. Okay, so I'm gonna very quickly go through this, but I want to focus on some really interesting uh, topological states that actually gets built up in this two-dimensional Mori structure. Okay, so experimental people have been doing this. This is a very, I, I'm sure everybody read this paper by Gein on uh, Van der Waals hydrostructures. The first two in his figure is graphene and hexagonal boronitrate. If you stack them together, you're gonna get all sorts of interesting behavior. There are many others, you know, transition metal dicarcogenides, you know, these things, and, and Maxine is another. So we can stack many different things on top of each other and the material phase space is basically infinite. So now let's look at some of these graphene and hexagonal boronitrate. People have been working on this for a long time, actually. This is way before. Uh, we did any theory, there was, nobody can do this theory before. Okay, this is a guidance paper where they look at this uh, stacking two layers. And then you have, it's very interesting that you have a hexagonal Mori pattern. Okay, so this is experimentally observed. All right, so an interesting question would be, you know, if graphene has a band structure look like this. Okay, this is a Dirac band structure. There is at the Fermi level, you have these Dirac cones due to this graphene. But when you have a larger structure of a Mori pattern, maybe you have another Dirac point due to this Mori patterns, right? So maybe there is a secondary, you know, Dirac cone. Uh, what are the physical effects of this? You know, it's very difficult to study theoretically because you know, nobody could calculate such big systems. So we can try this. And uh, uh, so here is a calculation to look at this, uh, you know, graphene boronitrate. So in order to do this, you have to build a supercell of, to calculate. This is the supercell. You repeat this to infinity. That's your two dimensional lattice. And then this lattice has, this unit cell has actually this many atoms, okay? And then you can see that this hexagonal structure in this Mori pattern. So what are the electronic structure of this? is interesting uh, to people uh, working in this field. And uh, this structure can fluctuate into the third dimension, for example. And then there are many high, you know, symmetry stacking places. What are the roles of these high level, you know, highly symmetric stacking local positions uh, to the electronic structure? So we have calculated this. You know, uh, this is the structure we want to do. You want to calculate such a big cell. And uh, uh, so if you study locally, you find this high level, very highly symmetric stacking, you know, patterns. If you only study this pattern, you cannot get the overall picture. Okay, you have to calculate everything. And then that's why this electronic structure is very interesting, very complicated. So this is a little bit like you are trying to feel the shape of an elephant, if you only you know, feel a little part, you get a wrong conclusion. So you have to you know, have an overall big picture. So we did this electronic structure calculation and try to compare with the earlier measurements on this ordinary you know, Dirac cone because of the interactions, you have some band gap. So the original Dirac band gap is very small. 
uh, due to the interaction between these two layers. And that agrees with this measurement. And then you have a very big, much bigger, actually secondary Dirac you know, point. So you have to use this non-strand non structure to get these results to compare with measurements. If you strain it, you take any of these high you know, symmetry stacking patterns to strain, then you are going to get wrong results. Okay. So this is not my main thing I want to talk about. Actually, I want to talk about very interesting uh, topological you know, states, which get induced by these Mori patterns. People have heard topological insulators. So let me very quickly go through this. So in differential geometry, we can use a very simple number G to classify your shapes. Okay, you know, this is a sphere, cube, you know, a banana or something. And you can calculate the curvature of these shapes and integrate the curvature of the surface and you get a number G. So for these kind of things, you get G to zero. So you know, all of this, they look very different, but their G is zero. So we think they are in the same topological class of the shapes. And if you have these shapes, they have a hole and this G is one, okay. And you can have G equal to two and so on. So you can classify geometric shapes by some curvature. And then that leads you to this integer topological environment. So this is done in mathematics, okay. So physicists trying to use this idea to classify band structures. You know, in band structure, when you have crystals, you have wave functions. And then in that wave function, you can define something, another curvature, okay, which is curvature in the block, you know, in the K space, which is a barrier curvature. It doesn't matter how we calculate, but there's a curvature in the electronic structure, okay. And then by integrating this, you get another number, which is a topological environment called churn number. And then this can classify your crystal band structures. Okay, so we can classify silicon, you know, germanium, you know, all sorts of band structures. Some of them have different numbers and they belong to different topological class. So all of this fuss of topological insulators are basically calculating different kinds of this environment. So this Mori pattern actually, this very important thing of this topological class is that suppose I have an insulator, I have a semiconductor here, I have another semiconductor, they belong to different topological class. It's possible, okay, they have different churn numbers. Then at the interface of this material system, you're gonna have an edge state, which is a conducting state. You can prove this actually by simply uh, you know, the, looking at this, how does, how can I change this topological number? Okay, so then you have to have this conducting state. So these are well established in the literature. Now in graphene, you know, the, in this uh, Mori patterns, we have a lot of these interfaces. You know, maybe we can get a lot of topological states. Okay, so basically this is what we're talking about, that we can define a churn number, a topological number for different pockets of the electronic states in graphene, okay? And then we need to have, we want to produce many, many of these topological states so that we can use it for electronic application, right? You need a lot of states to conduct. Okay, so this is what we have done. Indeed, if you stack your graphene to boron nitrate, you're gonna have different interactions at different parts of this double layer, okay? And then due to these atomic interactions between the two layers, you have states at the interface of this Maurice you know, structure, and they turn out to be topological. Okay, so you can publish a paper on this, analyzing these topological numbers and find that you have a lot of topological states which can be established by this Maurice pattern. So essentially these topological states are sitting at the interface between different you know, this, this is the helical topological states. One goes up, one goes down. These are electronic conducting channels, actually, in this, you know, uh, lattice. You have infinite number of them because you have a lot of Mori patterns. Okay, so this is very interesting. And uh, you can actually calculate topological number, as I said, you know, I, I wrote like C, but this is in the jargon, it's called valley number is N, but you have negative, positive, negative, positive. So you have different topological numbers. And then that goes along this, you know, uh, pattern of a Mori. Okay, so you can have a lot of topological states. You can imagine that you can apply an electric field and then you kill part of it. 
and let these conducting electrons go through the edges. You can have these states which are protected by this churn number. And then even if you have impurities here, it will not scatter these electrons. They have to go forward. You have to have a scattering which destroys the churn number, which is very hard to destroy, okay? And then that's why these are protected by the topological number. And that's why these states are extremely interesting from application point of view. You can do a bit more. We are talking about two-dimensional Mori lattice, and you can wrap it up into a nanotube. Uh, people have done this actually already. Graphene boron nitride nanotube have been done experimentally. And then because you have these topological states on this, you know, two-dimensional layers, when you wrap it up, it will become topological states going around the tube. Okay, so this is a topological nanotube. And you have different parts of the tube. The electronic structure has different churn numbers. And then they will not talk to, you, talk to each other. And moreover, in this paper, we analyzed that you can tune this tube in different chirality, right? You can wrap it in different directions. In some particular direction, you can get these topological states go around this tube like a coil. Okay, this is incredibly dense coil, actually. It was analyzed in this paper. Because of this coil, it generates magnetic field, which is amazing, actually. But to model this, you have to solve these huge systems. So you can see that this two-dimensional uh, you know, Mori pattern has a lot of you know, interesting properties. And we worked on other things like magnetic systems and, and so on. So there are a lot of physics and interesting application potential uh, for this Mori superlattices. As you can see that you can wrap all sorts of you know, uh, 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 coils. Right? So this is a infinite, as I said, material phase space to explore this kind of uh, properties. I will use the last five minutes or seven minutes to explain graphene is very important for another direction that our uh, firm and my research has worked, has been worked on, working on, uh, on transistor uh, designs, okay? So essentially in, tra in calculating transport property, in the end, we work on graphene, we work on two dimensional materials, we hope to produce some devices, okay? So to model these devices, you have to calculate electric current, uh, in classical transport, we solve Newtonian equation plus statistical mechanics, and this end up to something called Boltzmann transport equation. This is well known in the literature, uh, in textbooks, but for quantum transport, you solve, you know, you replace Newtonian equation from, you know, by Schrodinger equation. So in end up, you know, you end up with something called NEGF, non-equilibrium Green's function based the density function theory. This is my paper. You know, it's now cited more 3,000 times or something. This is sort of a, a, a general tool now uh, in semiconductor uh, design uh, toolbox. So here is the toolbox of semiconductor industry. You go all the way from drift diffusion, classical, to this NEGF DFT in the end. Okay, so in our firm, we have a tool which does this. Okay, and well, of course, we have these other tools. I want to thank my you know, uh, a team uh, developed these tools for transport simulations. So this particular problem that I want to solve is called low power. You know, now the transistors use a lot of power. You know, you buy a little laptop, you know, it's very hot. Okay, it's because you dissipate a lot of energy and then that prevented Moore's law actually from advancing further. Okay, one of the major you know, power source is due to, you know, heat, generated by, you know, basic electron going through. And then there is a problem uh, due to uh, the sub threshold swing. Basically, you need some voltage to turn on your current. Okay, so what we want to have a very sharp turn on, so I, I use a very small voltage, I reduce power. But in reality, our MOSFET, our transistor is following this curve. So you need a bigger voltage. And if you can change your curve to this curve, it will be much nicer. Okay, so this slope of this curve is SS. You want to reduce it. But unfortunately, thermodynamics requires this to be, the smallest one is like 60 okay, millivolt. You need 60 millivolt to increase your current by you know, one decade. You need many decades, you need many 60 millivolts, so you have a big voltage here. Okay, so what, if we can actually produce this red curve, 
we would re you know, relieve this problem a lot. So why this is, has a limit is because in your contact, you have a lot of electrons which suffers, which satisfies the direct distribution. Okay, so you have a tail, which you can your Fermi level is here or something, but you extend your tail of the Fermi distribution extends to very high temperature. So even though your transistor is turned off with this big barrier, you have all these hot electrons at the tail of the Fermi distribution, which is still goes through, and then that generates heat. Okay, that's why your current cannot be turned off actually, especially for very small transistors. So if we can somehow get rid of this hot electron, it would be very nice. How do you do that? Okay, so Raffle and other people. Uh, so we produce this, you know, using graphene, you can actually do this. Okay, so if you have a graphene, graphene has a very strange density state. You cannot beat the distribution function, but you can play with density states at the Fermi level. So the density states goes down actually as you increase energy. Okay, so basically your density states in the contact, if you use graphene as a contact, has some empty space. There is no density state. So that you can actually help you to reduce current. Okay, if your energy goes up, this cuts off the hot electrons. If you have a double layer graphene, you actually produce a band gap, okay, in the graphene. And then there is no hot electron. It really cuts off this Fermi distribution. So if you do that, you do a modeling, you find that your 60 millivolt per decade becomes 28 millivolt per decade. So this is very exciting. This graphene can help us. Experimentally, my colleagues, you know, of course, you know, here is me and we did some theory. My colleagues, they did this graphene transistor with the graphene here. And then they, they use nanotube as their ch channel. But the important thing is the source, okay, which is the graphene. And indeed, your density state goes down, it cuts off your hot electrons. So it turns off your current much quicker compared with you know, silicon or other you know, heavily doped you know, metal or something, your Fermi di distribution really is there. You, you have a lot of hot electrons. That's why you have this 60 millivolt decade. But, but if you use graphene, you can cut it off. And then your current is much sharper. Okay, so you use much smaller voltage to turn on your transistor. And then the transistor works very good, just like the usual MOSFET. So this paper publishes uh, this discovery. So this graphene actually is very important. And uh, uh, so we made the like a prediction, you know, uh, it's very interesting. I want to tell you a story that uh, we, you know, theoretically we did a single layer graphene and we got some limit to like, you know, 35 millivolt per decade. But the experimental people produced you know, one transistor, which is eight millivolt per decade, is so small and then it's puzzled out for a year. Actually, it took us a while to figure out that is because they probably have a double layer graphene, which produces a gap that really cut, you know, cut this hot electrons down very well. So they did you know, much more experiment later on to show that it is in the truth. So this is a very nice uh, uh, discovery. Okay, so my, um, you know, here are the measurement compared with the theoretical calculation, but the important thing I want to convey is that graphene can be used at the contact electrode for field effect transistors, and that can produce low power transistors with very high end um, uh, production, okay? So this is, uh, let's hope that this will extend our Moore's law, okay, for high performance computing. And uh, we are collaborating with these experimental people, uh, try to see whether we can produce an old carbon technology that really can uh, 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 can be a supplement. Or we cannot replace silicon, but we can supplement uh, in certain technology. Okay, so this is very interesting, I think, for graphene. Okay, this brings me to the last slide. I don't want to bore you to uh, read this, but basically I want to um, explain that I, I took some time to explain this computational modeling tools that is advanced so much that we can actually solve uh, some practical problems in material science. And, and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, so right now we are actually focusing on this last thing that I said that we want to push our rescue tool, which solves the lens scale of first principle of modeling. Uh, we want to push it into solving a time scale problem. So we wish to look at, there are a lot of, you know, 
functional, not functional, you know, the structural material evolution, you know, chemical reactions, which needs large time scales. So this is what we are working on very heavily uh, in our firm. And then I, I hope that I can, uh, in the future, uh, give you a, a presentation about this. This is uh, also a very exciting research we're doing. Okay, thank you. And uh, I went over by one or two minutes. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks a lot. Professor Guo, thank you very much. That uh, That's fascinating, the, uh, the work that you've done. And I really appreciate um, showing the practical example at the end, which, which kind of brings it home. So you looked at the theoretical potential uh, of these materials in this, in this case with uh, graphene used uh, in these transistors and then um, have it backed up with, uh, with actual, um, actual testing. So that was, I, I thought that was very helpful and very useful. We do have a question for you, Professor Guo. Yeah. Um, what is used to make contacts in the graphene contact-based FETs? The con this FE this graphene is in contact with silicon substrate, okay, but the electrons coming from that outside contact goes through the graphene, and then the graphene is p-doped, and then in this case we generate this um, uh, 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 the gap actually or the density of states the minimum density states uh, above the Fermi level. So this is the p-type uh, FET. So the experimental people also did n-type NMOS, uh, which also works. The same principle actually works. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. Um, the, the other question is, how can we best use graphene and OFETs um, as a dielectric or as a sensing layer? Oh, that's a question. That's a very interesting question. Uh, I have to, uh, you know, for optical, um, no, graphene has no band gap. Okay, so uh, 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 so it's very easy to make transitions. So in a way, it is uh, uh, it's a good material. Okay, and uh, but sometimes we want to have some selection or something. Maybe we need some band gaps. Uh, so so I have not really worked very much on this optical properties of graphene, and uh, but indeed we can calculate the optical properties. Uh, in some of the tools that we have. In Rescue, we have a, a tool which calculates all sorts of, you know, uh, you know, Raman, infrared, all sorts of, you know, optical properties of materials. So we could study that. So my own research is mostly focused on elect electronics. And our work is trying to create a band gap, right? <laughs> In order to do transistor application. But I, 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 I can't answer that question because I didn't do that kind of work. Uh, but I will take a look. It's a very interesting question. And uh, uh, yeah, we can actually calculate a lot of optical properties. Um, so I have some very large research using our tools for um, infrared detectors, uh, for example. Uh, but uh, they tend to use uh, more ordinary uh, semiconductors. Okay. Interesting. Thank you for that. Um, another question we have is if you have experienced similar experiments applying three or more layers at the interface. And I assume when they say three or more layers, we're talking about graphene materials. Excellent. There is some very new experiment. You know, these three papers are published in big journals like Nature and you know, that people actually produce triple layer graphene with some little angle uh, that showed you know, two layer will give you a moray and three layer give you two morays. Okay, so these two moray patterns have very interesting local density states, uh, electronic states localized on these triple layers. And uh, uh, so we have not done that calculation, but I have encouraged one of my graduate students to do it. And you know, she just become a professor. So she is setting up to look at this new triple layer and uh, they involve even bigger number of atoms, but they are completely re within reach. So if you are interested, we can take a look, uh, absolutely. Okay, uh, so this, uh, we have worked out uh, the supercell structures, you know, they are, they are much more than, you know, 10,000 atoms. They are maybe like you know, 25,000 atoms or something, but it's possible that our tools can actually calculate them. Uh, so what, what is interesting there is, is to look at the localized 
uh, electronic states in this double Mori pattern. Uh, so they're, they're very in, new experiments, actually, maybe in, within the last couple of years. Uh, so it's uh, exciting uh, work. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, another interesting question. Can you make simulations with magnetic fields present? Can you uh, simulate uh, the fractional Hall effect in graphene? Uh, no. Uh, uh, for, for magnetic field, for orbital magnetic field, we can actually do but we have some other tools, uh, especially for this. I, I didn't have time to talk about. Uh, we um, we do uh, 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 magnetic field. Okay, so in magnetic fields. So let me today I talk about these first principles tools. So they start with atoms, and then when you have atoms, uh, the energy scales are you know 0.5 eV or one eV. When you put magnetic field, the magnetic field energy scale is so small, and then it will not you know, generate very much work, uh, very much difference in this atomic simulation. So to, to see magnetic field in quantum Hall effect, for example, you need a nanostructure, which is much bigger than this scale, maybe a thousand angstroms or a hundred angstroms or something like that. Uh, and then we have another tool that I mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, you will see the slides so called QTCAT, where we study uh, quantum dots and two dimensional electron gas and then the magnetic field will give you a cyclotron radius within the size. And indeed, we can study that. But to calculate the fractional quantum Hall effect, you need strongly correlated system. And then that is a very difficult, that's a different field and our tool, we will not apply there. We cannot do that, okay? But for magnetic field, what we are doing is for spin qubits. And then we do a lot of, um, you know, um, uh, spin resonance, you know, things like that. Uh, they, they require orbital magnetic field as well as uh, Zeeman fields and those things we can do. Uh, Integral quantum Hall effect we can do, but for fractional quantum Hall effect, we cannot calculate uh, with our tool yet. Understood, Thank understood. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, another question, um, and I think this relates to uh, what you were speaking of in the example is the need to manage heat um, in these systems. Have you experienced the thermal conductive properties or can you measure those? Uh, excellent question. Okay, uh, so this is absolutely important for transistor design. And uh, I worked for many years on this, uh, but solving, you know, for <laughs> the classical drift diffusion of the heat. Okay, you can do that. But for these uh, atomic first principles, uh, there are two contributions. Uh, one is simply, uh, the, you know, like a seabed coefficient. The electron goes by and generate heat. Okay, that coefficient you can calculate. Yes, indeed. But if you want to calculate phonon, phonon transport, there are well-established tools. And in our tool, we can calculate all the phonon properties. And then you will have to solve this Boltzmann transport equation for phonons. So there are well-established tools in the literature or uh, even there are companies uh, which produce those tools, they need the phonon dispersion and then solve a distribution, solve the distribution function of the phonons uh, in a classical approach. So that can be done. If you really want to solve phonon quantum mechanically, it can still be done. Okay, so, uh, you know, I have published some papers on those things, but these kind of tools um, are very limited in scope and they cannot be applied yet to transistor design. Okay, so they are academic. You publish through the reference, but you cannot really simulate a real transistor for that. So for real transistor heat generation, we still solve uh, uh, semi-classical uh, equations uh, of both uh, type to solve the, the heat diffusion. And to generate phonons, we can calculate. So you can, you can tell, you can calculate the phonon source and how this heat is generated and, and, and then uh, propagate through the system. We do it that way, okay. So if you are interested in this phonon transport codes, I can tell you later uh, privately or, or something. Okay, uh, there are these codes around, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, so I, I have some you know, slightly different questions myself. So I, I, was, at, I was at a different 2D uh, conference at uh, Penn State two weeks ago in, in the talk about two dimensional materials and their use in electronics. The fact that graphene doesn't have a natural band gap, it would need to be engineered. Etc. But there are a lot of different places, you know, not just in logic circuits, but there are a lot of different places where this material could be used. And one of the suggestions was uh, graphene could be very good 
in the interconnects, right? And on this heat management aspect and in different areas. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, what, what are the practical applications that you see, if, if that's something you can speak to? And then the, the follow-up to that or tangential to that would be, and how far away do you think we are from being able to actually apply these in a, in a, um, in a manufacturing setting? Well, the last question, I, I think there are much more qualified people in the audience to answer. And so I will bypass that question. <laughs> and, uh, but for interconnect, um, uh, I, for many years, I worked with uh, SRC, Semiconductor Research Corporation on interconnect. These are interconnect wires, and that's a very major problem uh, for metal wires. Uh, you know, Intel actually changed their process recently from copper, you know, many years ago it was aluminum. And so what I worked on are copper nanowires. Uh, these wires goes down to 42 nanometers in diameter, then the resistivity increased by a factor of two. And then that kills you. Okay, so, uh, and then so for many years we work on how do you reduce copper interconnect uh, resistivity? Okay, and then you identify from physics point of view using our tools, you know, uh, what are the scattering mechanism, you know, things like that. I know recently Intel has changed this process to some other metal uh, you know, uh, systems. And then they also have very big research uh, for many years on yeah, hopefully using uh, carbon nanotubes or carbon, I don't know whether layers as interconnect. Uh, the problem with this carbon nanotube is whether you can always select uh, the metal tubes. Okay, so this is a experimental challenge uh, that people have made tremendous progress by um, by grow only metal tubes or something like that. But it's also it's still it's not completely perfect. Okay, you know if I produce a copper wire, it's metal. Okay, but if I produce nanotube, I have a chance of getting a semiconductor tube, uh, which is not going to work there. So I I think from the from what I know uh, through my research, through this interconnect work, uh, I think this uh, nanotube is still a little distance from real application. So I don't see this as a um, replacement for existing technology. I see this as a niche to um, supplement. Uh, there are certain places, you know, for example, in the transistor I showed you, uh, these people, there are a lot of similar people okay, in the world uh, produce, trying to push uh, old carbon technology. You know, they recognize that you can never replace silicon, but you can have places where these very high level transistors can supplement, uh, uh, you know, the silicon, you know, in, for example, in the computational speed, you know, this has much smaller resistance, your RC delay will be much lower, you know, there are a lot of other things that is good. And then graphene, is easier to interact with molecules. So there are people I work with on chemistry, you know, these people trying to do chemical reactions uh, down to the single molecule level. So uh, how do you hook up these molecules with some metal is very hard to do, but with graphene is much easier. So uh, because these are all carbon-based systems. So as I see it from a technology point of view, um, this, I think for the structural side, it has much more uh, application for electronic side is still frontier research. This is what I, I think right now. Okay. Uh, Excellent. But, but I'm extremely excited by this uh, graphene Dirac based. And then there are lots more experiments. Actually, after we did this theory, there are many more others. People use different kinds of 2D material to realize the same thing. There is a paper on diodes, you know, exactly the same. And uh, uh, so I was given a talk on this topic in this IEDM meeting, this international device meeting, you know, uh, uh, on this kind of thing. So there are a lot of uh, companies inter interested in uh, reducing the power consumption through uh, the transistor. This is not for low level application, these are for high performance computing. Um, the more slow, can you extend it, okay? Uh, so I think in this kind of directions, they will be very, very interesting. But the, the important thing is to produce very well controlled single or double or triple layers, you know, a few layers. That's the challenge, I think. And that, that relates to another question that we have. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to that one. We have a couple more questions, if you're okay mm -hmm. to stay with us. That's and, fine, and, yeah. Um, 
So one of, one of the questions was related to um, the actual quality of the graphene material that you've seen. And we know from the Graphene Council, because we do extensive material characterization and testing services, we get to see a lot of different materials and there can be um, you know, defects in the graphene material if it's not a perfect crystal. Um, have you observed different level, what we would refer to as different levels of quality or, or level of defect in the material and, and um, has that had an impact on the outcomes? Yes, definitely. We have some projects to look at this, uh, uh, this, this line defect in graphene structures. They will scatter electrons across the interface. You can easily, because of this uh, five or seven you know, defect, you can produce these lines, which give you a grand boundary or, or something like that. Uh, so indeed, so in this particular transistor work we, uh, and some other related work, these are in the physics and chemistry and engineering labs. They can produce very large scale, very nice single layer graphene and uh, we almost you know, uh, defect free. So these are for academic reasons. Yes, these defects is uh, we have to study. But in the literature, some of these defect states, you see, I showed you the graphene, um, uh, uh, Mori pattern, right? I need two layers. But if you only have one graphene layer, but with some defect in the middle, the two sides of the defect can belong to a different topological class. So there are nature papers published. They have found the, the, the topological states along the defect line and which has very small you know, resistance. So these are interesting things which existed even just on a defect on the, uh, on the graphene. So, so this uh, 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 research, uh, I think uh, with time, you know, we are going to study more. Uh, if we can get those kind of defect lines, which is with topological states there, you can just use a single layer graphene to do this. And then that's uh, very interesting. So these are experimental papers, people measure it. Okay, so uh, it's not that a theoretical sort of, you know, spherical cow actually mm. is measured. Okay, yeah, Excellent. so defect is a problem, yeah. So I'm gonna take, I think we have two more questions here. One is, um, can the software simulate UV absorption frequency? Oh my God, um, <laughs> very good question. Um, in principle, yes, but our software so far is more, is more toward the infrared, you know, this semiconductor type uh, for UV, um, you know, like three nitride or something, or, or, you know, gallium nitride, not gallium nitride, yeah, maybe gallium nitride, uh, aluminum nitride, you know, these very big band gaps. Uh, definitely we can calculate the band structure very well, okay. And uh, uh, so I don't see uh, why not. We actually calculate the band structures of these white band gap semiconductors in, in three, five in nitrides. And uh, so uh, some of them has uh, in the UV uh, region, Regime. So, from a software point of view, uh, we I don't see uh, why not. Okay, so we, we should be able to. So it depends on the UV. Um, so maybe you want to have a UV absorption constant, you know, things like that. I have not done that particular calculation, but we calculate all sorts of, you know, absorption infrared, you know, and, and things like that. So uh, because our research is related to semiconductor, so uh, but UV is semiconductor. So I have to say. Uh, yes, I, I believe we can. So if you're interested, we can try it. And uh, <laughs> we calculate the band structure of aluminum nitride. So uh, yeah, I had a project with um, some colleagues, experimental colleagues, try to produce uh, UV LEDs. Okay, so we use these tools to calculate band structures before. Okay. Excellent. So very big field, yeah. Well, I, th I think, um, so from my, my observation is that, you know, this is a very versatile um, tool or set of tools that you and your team have developed um, that, be, that can be used in, uh, in a university research setting. It can be also be used in an industrial R&D setting um, to evaluate uh, materials for, for the next generation, especially of electronics. Um, so the last question that we have, and I think we'll conclude after that, is um, will, will the company, uh, Nanoacademics, will it uh, provide an easy to follow step on how to use this Rescue Plus software? Uh, do you have videos or do you have some instruction? Basically, if I understand the question correctly is, you know, how can somebody use this software and what kind of support or instruction can they get? Outstanding question. Okay. Uh, 
So this is exactly what we are working on. We have a team of computer you know, people and uh, are trying to reduce the difficulty. And we have videos, we have YouTubes. Maybe Jeremy, you can uh, explain a little bit about this. And we are not perfect, but we are trying, we are moving to this direction very heavily now. Okay, Jeremy. Yeah, so uh, we have a comprehensive uh, documentation portal with um, uh, user manual tutorials online. Uh, we have a community forum as well, uh, where you can find uh, basic or complex uh, technical Q&A, where we provide support uh, in a timely manner. So that's a, a very good resources uh, for, for the users. But definitely the online documentation and the, the team support, the, the, the technical support that, that the team can provide, uh, we we are very responsive and we can definitely uh, bring customized uh, support uh, as well uh, for direct questions. We are very close to to our to our community, so yeah, that's not a, that's not a problem. And we can even do some uh, custom uh, tutorial videos if necessary. So the, there is no absolutely no worries at all to 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 bring support to to our users. Excellent. Thank thank you, Jeremy. Um, what I would like to say at this point too is I, I think you know what you what you have developed here and what you are bringing to the community of everyone who's working not just on graphene, but on maxines, transition metal dicalcogenides, and other two D materials, is um, is a way to do this theoretical experimentation and evaluate the materials. The other side of that is to actually create these devices and actually create <clears throat> these two D materials. And a lot of that work is done in universities, but increasingly we're seeing uh, commercialization. Graphene has become extremely mature on the ability to produce commercial volumes and grades of graphene materials. And the Graphene Council helps to bring all these parties together so that we can move this from you know, just theoretical or experimental into actual applications so we can unleash what these materials can actually do. So from that perspective, um, you know, I want to thank you for being a member of the Graphene Council, you and your team. Um, we're very happy to have hosted today's webinar, found it very educational and, um, and really highlights um, the versatility and the, and the, power of the, uh, the power of the software that you guys have developed. And I want to thank you uh, both for your time and uh, for preparing today's presentation. So thank you for that. Thanks, Terrence. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I think I want to add one sentence is that since this can be produced in bulk, these materials, and then sometimes we may want to add uh, not only that my, you know, graphene system is good, but why that is good. So we can actually provide this why. Okay, we understood from atomic point of view, and we have some many other tools, and that will give us the scientific background uh, for certain questions which sometimes is difficult to you know to be intuitive okay so we can find out why that is so and then that would probably um, reduce the experimentation and uh, uh, we'll point out how to improve it further and that's exactly where we actually you know collaborate with a lot of firms okay ourselves and then that's uh, these firms need this understanding to improve the product before uh, actually spending money and try to synthesize them. So this is the where this software uh, is uh, valuable. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming. And I hope uh, that we got something out of it. Uh, hope to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Terence. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you, gentlemen. Have a great rest of your week. Take care. You too. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.